Hi, Benny. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Looking forward to today's chat. It's going to be very exciting. Yeah, it's going to be really good. Um, firstly, let's just get it into the screen. We are talking about this amazing book, Diverse Educators and Manifesto, edited by Benny Cara and Hannah Wilson. So we're going to start the book chat today with Benny. Um, and Benny, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about yourself first. And then we're going to touch on the Equality Act and the Protected Characteristics and then talk about the story of the book from your perspective. So I'm going to hand over to you, Benny. OK, thank you so much for having me. Um, first of all, I'd like to say how proud I am of this book. Um, and there's lots of reasons why we decided to do this book in the first place. Um, we were conscious that teachers, you know, teachers in, in working in schools across the country were asking very similar questions. Um, and, you know, we wanted to have a repository of ideas around um, different characteristics that people have uh, that would allow an insight not only into the lived experience of those educators, but also an insight into the educational landscape when it came to uh, particular characteristics. Um, and this is particularly important to me as a person who very much uh, considers herself to have an intersectional identity. So I am a woman, I'm Asian, I'm bisexual and I am um, disabled. And, you know, when we when I think about all of the aspects of my identity that I kind of consider on a daily basis, you know, how does somebody out there who is dealing with me know how to deal with me unless there is some sort of manual to that? Um, and so, you know, the conversations Hannah and I had about that, uh, firstly, kind of very much seedling um, conversations around what would it look like? Uh, what were we trying to achieve? Um, and we kind of decided on this this sense of the, the the balance between lived experience and the and the research because we did feel that sometimes uh, when we talk about characteristics and identity in education, it can um, feel a little bit anecdotal rather than based in statistics or um, qualitative data. And so we wanted to strike that balance. Um, and the, the process was very much around deciding how we would structure the book. And we thought, look, you know, we're talking about protected characteristics. We're talking about the Equality Act. Um, and so we went to the Equality Act and looked at those nine protected characteristics. Now, we're conscious that, you know, we talk about protected characteristics like everybody knows what they are um so just to be absolutely clear we decided on um a chapter per protected characteristics so chapter on age a chapter on gender reassignment a chapter on marriage and or civil partnership a chapter chapter on pregnancy and maternity one on disability one on race one on religion or belief one on sex and one on sexual orientation but we didn't want to stop there because we recognised when we were trying to put this together that there were so many overlaps between those protected characteristics according to the Equality Act. And uh, we took a while to come to it, but we did then decide eventually to have a 10th chapter um, called Intersectionality, where you know some of the narratives around having more than one protected characteristic would be would be placed in that section. Um, and I'm really glad we did that, you know, but you'll find that actually the whole book, you can see the overlaps, people kind of, you know, talking about several protected characteristics at once, even though technically they are within uh, one chapter. Uh, so that was, you know, that was the kind of rationale and the, the structure um, for the book. And, and certainly, you know, I don't think we could have anticipated um, how much work it would be mm -hmm. uh, and how how much in in some ways we in some ways and I said in some ways very tongue-in-cheek we would enjoy it there were definitely moments we didn't enjoy um, but certainly it's felt like a worthwhile endeavor um, and we felt like we have the right structure for it absolutely I think I can hand on heart say the way that it's been structured is going to enable someone to understand the different protected characteristics but also understand that intersectional idea of identity because actually a lot of us when we think about it probably have some of these protected characteristics as part of our identity so how did you come to sort of deciding who would write the those chapters it's a big question <laughs> it's a very good question and you know what it actually it probably took longer to do that than to get kind of some of the chapters in because you know there was a real responsibility 
in making sure the right voices were in the book and, and what does even what does right voice mean um and one of the things we came across really quickly is that we had um when we put out a request we said you know volunteer for this um and we had some ideas of who we wanted of course but it was very much an open process um and we said you know come come to us and say what you want and we had immediately had hundreds of responses from people from very similar demographics. So the work in diversity is tending to be done by women. Um, and within that, we noticed actually it was mostly white women coming forward and saying, you know, I want to be part of this. Um, and we, when we sort of laid it out and it was very much spreadsheet, like let's see how this all fits. We noticed that we had a lack of men and lack of men of color in particular. Um, but, you know, this was a case of like, well, we could just go with our first uh, set of volunteers or we could actually do something about this because, you know, we recognise some people don't come to the table most you know, because they haven't heard what's going on or don't feel it's their place. And so we made some brave decisions to approach certain people and say, your voice is really important. Can you come and join us um, on this journey? Um, particularly tapping uh, men of colour on the shoulder and saying, actually, we really need you represented in this space. Um, we were very lucky in that we had enough chapters for our gender reassignment, enough writers for our gender reassignment chapter, which almost is unheard of to have that many um, in, in that space willing to talk in, in what's quite a hostile atmosphere. Um, so, you know... <laughs> I still, I still feel like we could get the bat. We could have got the bat better. But we were working within certain timelines, and you know, that means that eventually you have to pause and go. Right, is this best fit in terms mm -hmm. of authors? Um, and you know, are they are they going to be representative of the world um, that we work in, that we live in? Um, and at some point, we had to say, yeah, this is it. These are our, these are our writers, and we had people join us. And then decide they couldn't commit and, you know, for, for whatever reason. Um, and so there was some chopping and changing halfway through as well. And then kind of maintaining that balance as we go, um, mm. which I would say was only marginally stressful. Um, but <laughs> it had to be done. Um, so, yeah, we were quite lucky that we had some people we could draw on uh, for favours to come in and fill some of the gaps as well. So, yeah, tough, I tough things. I all worth it though. I think the thing that struck me about some of the um, the chapters was that authentic story that was told as well mm -hmm. and that lived experience as you've said um, but it was also the idea that you're asking people to sort of be vulnerable as well mm -hmm. to a very big audience in an educational setting and I'd class this as, a, as an academic book I could see this in universities up and down the country hopefully around the world were there any conversations around vulnerability and how did you sort of because you can't really you can't predict the outcomes of anything can you so how did you manage to make sure that the people because some of these stories are beautifully authentic but you have to really brave at the same time so how, how did you manage that aspect of it I mean, we had to have some honest conversations with people and we particularly with our trans writers, knowing how hostile the um, the atmosphere is around trans narratives, um, you know, to say, look, we will do everything we can to make sure that you are protected. So it was a case of, you know, how public do you want to be? Do you want to use your real name? Do you want to use your real pronouns? You know, that kind of thing. So how how does that work? Um, and, you know, we had some very, very um, scary conversations about what would happen, you know, if one of our writers was publicly criticised, how would we respond? What would our response be if someone said you can't talk about race like that in mm. schools? Um, and so you have to anticipate some of this and then just hope it doesn't happen. Um, and, you know, our, our writers were pretty upfront and, you know, they, they told us what their preferences were. So, you know, some people were very happy to be involved in the publicity pre um, publication some people said you know what actually no not yet I'm not ready and that was absolutely fine um, and you know I'm I think when I kind of go back over the book the thing that um, strikes me is yes it's an academic book but it's so rooted in human experience um, and one of the things that I you know I is the marker of something that hits home is whether it makes me emotional. Hannah cries all the time. I'm not a crier, but if I'm crying, something's happening. <laughs> so, um, you know, there were some stories that I read in there that I just 
a you know disbelief and sometimes be just sheer emotion about what someone has gone through um and then there was resonance as well you know you can hear your own experiences in some of our writers work um and you're thinking gosh you know i'm not the only one and that's the impact that i want it to have long term for some people to say look actually uh i have this protected characteristic you know i i feel vulnerable in in school but i'm not the only one and and this is how someone else has dealt with it I think what it shows definitely is is the is the best picture of how education can be in terms of being your authentic self in a space where you're enabling we're meant to be enabling the younger generation, aren't we? And so it it is. It's an incredible book. Um, Benny, what I'm going to do is so we've got uh, ten minutes left. Is I'm going to just go through your key questions that you put at the end of your chapter. Because um, what would be interesting, I'm going to do it with all the um, contributors, is how you would answer it based on either your lived experience or in like future Benny, how might she answer those? So, how can you use this book to drive diversity, equity, and inclusion in our schools? Mm. So, I mean, of course, the first uh, port of call is having the book in school. Um, but, you know, this book has always been considered um, a kind of not just a how to guide, but a kind of um, almost guided process, something that guides your process. Um, and, you know, there's so many ways that schools can pick this up and make it a meaningful part of their CPD. Uh, it might be that, you know, you do a protected characteristic a week. You know, or and you know, make sure that chapter is available for for people to read, or distribute chapters to different groups within the school, um, and ask for feedback that way. Um, you know, I, I want it to be a, a heads uh, kind of right hand for when these like ideas and issues crop up, um, so that you know, it's like you know, what's what's been said about this, what's best practice, um, and when policy is being made, and I think this is where the most important thing is, where policy is being created or rewritten or re um, rejigged, you know, do it with this book in mind. Go back and have a look. So when you're doing your equality policy and your um, you know, your or your DEI policy, whatever it's called, have a look at the book because people are literally telling you what best practice is um, from their lived experience, but from their professional life as well. So they've seen it work somewhere else. They've gone through that process for you already. So it's there as a guide. Um, but I think more importantly, it's not just schools. It's like you said, ITT. And we're really lucky that um, lots of universities have said this is now on the university reading list, which, again, was something that, again, we could have only just sort of dreamed of before mm -hmm. we started. Um, but that's that's the thing that makes me the proudest, I think, that actually early years or early career teachers will be picking this up and that will be part of their consciousness throughout their career, as opposed to, you know, for us, it was something that came a bit later. Yeah, I think it's almost like you learn it as you're going through as well. Yeah. And it's and I think that's the that's the contention sometimes that that language or that shared experience hasn't been shared. So therefore, how, how are you meant to navigate it when you experience it? Because you haven't had any training before. So mm -hmm. I think in terms of um, ethic, ethics, yeah, you'd want it on ITT courses. Mm. So where are your gaps when it comes to the protected characteristics? I can't really ask you that because I don't feel like you'd have any. But... <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, you know, one of the things that, like, you know, I can't come back to is pregnancy and maternity. Um, you know, my own story is that I don't have children. Um, we have attempted to have children. And it's uh, the, the story is, is one of, you know, absence of, of not being able to do something. So understanding what it's like to be pregnant and a mother is not a characteristic that I share. I can't do that, you know. Um, and so when I hear people's stories and on um, how the education system has um, either helped or hindered when it came to maternity leave, childcare, that kind of thing, it's fascinating to me. It's not something I feel like I can contribute to, but it's something that you know I read about and think, gosh, you know, that's that's an incredibly important thing to know about as someone who hasn't been through it. Um, and I'm conscious also that some of the narratives around race don't apply to me. You know, I'm not a black woman. So when I'm reading chapters about how black women are being treated in, in education, I can read that and and get an insight into it. But I don't know it. And I and I and I don't feel like I have um, I only have somebody else's lived experience to, to draw upon. Um, and so I think, you know, as many as many as many protected characteristics as I have, 
I am, um, there are still gaps for me. And I, I feel like I'm constantly learning. And I learned a lot while I was reading this book um, because there were certain things that I hadn't considered. Alison Zion's um, chapter on being Jewish and, and you know, being a, an artifact in school. It was fascinating. And I just thought, gosh, I'd never even thought of that. Mm -hmm. So that's the great thing, actually, that if you've got protected characteristics, you feel like you don't need to read this book. But actually, there's stuff in there. That you think, oh, God, I, I hadn't even considered that. Thank you for that answer, Benny. And I think it's that idea that with that question, definitely it, ha it asks you to self-reflect and be a bit more self-aware. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think having no children or sort of watching outside, and I think I spoke about it earlier this week, Jackie, when she comes on, um, it's that you see the lived experience of women, but that the miseducation or lack of education as well, that even women going into pregnancy don't realise how much pay and things like that can actually affect them so yeah. and in in a sense inequality is bred there isn't it mm. um right last one then what is the burning need in your establishment that has to be addressed so imagine you were head teacher or ceo might it, well i think it will happen <laughs> when is the what is the burning need in your establishment that has to be addressed when it comes to the protected characteristics and how would you go about finding that out so yeah, this is this is a kind of very speculative question, obviously, because I'm I'm not ahead, um, and yeah. you know, and I actually think my organisation has some burning needs, but I don't want to talk about them because obviously that is that is for us to to deal with. But it is you know when you're a head teacher, that idea of a burning need uh, is quite kind of um, nebulous in the sense that you know what feels acute is uh, results progress a attainment um safeguarding and all of those things are really really important but people forget that burning need around race or gender or um, disability can also be a safeguarding issue mm -hmm. and so I think a broadening of that understanding of what safeguarding actually means yes it's the acute stuff the immediate danger but also the safeguarding of children over time when they have protected characteristics and I think actually sometimes leadership um, when we're in a, in a space of leadership we forget that, that those things are safeguarding issues uh, particularly if you have feedback coming to you saying that you know either racism or homophobia or ableism is a part and parcel of playground speak and that kind of thing and so the first thing is around listening to children and listening to your staff um, when they're saying yep it's a it's a reality you know our children will often say yeah we hear gay as an insult all the time and that's not seen as a burning need but when you're mm. thinking about people's identity being used as an insult that idea of self-devaluation the lowering of self-esteem that comes with that that is actually a burning need and so mm -hmm. how does the school go about addressing that what what happens to policy what happens to practice in that um and then you have to look at some of the data you know look at the data of some of your your marginalized groups and i'm not just talking in terms of send or broad categories of race i'm looking at actually your your lgbt kids you know where they are identified are they achieving at the same rate are they attending at the same rate in the school because actually you'll find that attendance rates for some of our most vulnerable LGBT kids can be much lower than their straight peers. Um, so, you know, I think identifying a burning need uh, feels very subjective, um, but, you know, each school has its flavour, each school has its sense of who they are. And I think, you know, teachers who spend a lot of time with children are the best port, for the first port of call. People say, should we ask parents? And I know that there are conflicts sometimes between what parents want and what children see and, and what children want and what the school wants. Um, and I like, only have to point to some of the kind of issues around transgender children um, to know that, you know, there's potential conflict between what a school thinks is a burning need and what a family thinks is a burning need or what one particular religion or faith, you know, thinks of as a burning need. So, you know, we've got to be carefully navigating those spaces uh, and not making any assumptions. You know, you can't make any assumptions about your community, about your families. Uh, but certainly if I was ahead, I'd be looking at listening um, and listening for longer than you think, you know, because your first your first responses aren't always the most accurate. Um, mm -hmm does the data and I say data meaning qualitative and uh, quantitative what what does that say over time what are the patterns in the school um, what are the prevailing narratives around particular groups um, and that might be about 
you know, teachers who are pregnant. That might be about uh, members of staff who want to come out. That might be about children who are being bullied um, for their disability. So, you know, it's a, it's a complex one. Um, and I think if I was a CEO, I would be thinking about policy and how actually structurally we can address these issues as opposed to firefight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't want to be kind of just putting out fires. We want to make sure the source of those fires is extinguished. Uh, and quite often um, how we set out our values as an organization addresses burning needs. Um, and so I would ask, you know, if your values truly are respect, um, you know, acceptance, the British values, tolerance, you know, I don't like that word, but if that's the word we're going to use, that's the word we're going to use. But if it is that, then how are you actually enacting that in, in real life? I think, Benny, thank you. We'll, we'll leave it there. That was brilliant. Thank you. And I think just bringing it back down to that idea that the this book is rooted in human stories. And I think if anything, it will enable some level of empathy, whether you've lived the experience or not. There's people here sharing these stories that will enable you to hopefully understand a little bit more about what it's like. So thank you so much, Benny. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Right, I'm going to add Jackie. Thank you, Benny. And here we go, Jackie. So Jackie is one of the chapter editors um, who did an amazing job. So I was part of Jackie's team for this book on marriage and civil partnership. Um, so, Jackie, I'm going to ask you to sort of introduce yourself a little bit and then talk about your, um, well, what you think of this chapter and what people will hopefully get from this chapter, please. OK, thanks, Kieran. And it was fun to have you in the chapter team. So hopefully we'll do a bit of a double act here. Um, so um, how did I get involved in this? Um, I was involved with Diverse Ed right from the first conference. And I went along to it, you know, um, we talk about evidence informed education and how things changed. And I had a, there was a lovely metaphor that Alison Peacock used at an event I was at yesterday about education and evidence being like a river and how if you go along the river, the context can change and you learn more and more and more and you add. So um, marriage and civil partnership was our chapter. And it's along with age, it's one of the protected characteristics that is often neglected, if you like, because it doesn't maybe seem so relevant or whatever. I don't know. But how I got involved with Diverse Ed was um, my daughter and daughter-in-law made me a grandma almost five years ago. And I have a little grandson. And I all of a sudden, I started looking to see what was life at school going to be like for him when he would start school and nursery and so on and he'd be starting school in September and it was interesting talking about the whole intersectionality of things listening to Benny because I went along to the first diverse ed event looking for answers to that but then met so many other people who had you know there was the overlap with protected characteristics and so on and I discovered so much more and that's one of I think the real joys and positives of this book People will lift it wanting to find out something about maybe a protected characteristic. And as they sort of dip into that and delve into that, they'll find other things that are totally unexpected. So that was my experience with the chapter with marriage and civil partnership. I thought, what have we got to say about this that's going to be relevant to our school communities? And I suppose I, I came up with this ER thing which isn't quite what it seems. It's this sort of expectations of what is meant by marriage and civil partnership, what the actual lived experiences are. Um, relation so that's the two E's, if you like. And the R is relationships and what people think about relationships and then what the reality is, actually. So um, we had a fantastic group of us in the, the chapter but Benny mentioned earlier about the dearth of men wanting to talk. And in particular in this chapter, there, there, was, there was only one male contributor to it. So men obviously don't want to talk or reveal too much about marriage and relationships and divorce. So I wrote a blog and I put it out there to see if I could get a little bit more that I could include 
within my area and the title of the blog was it's not just the person that you're marrying and that was on the back of the Oprah interview with Harry and Meghan it's not just the person you're marrying and in their case it was an institution and I asked people to substitute institution with it's a family, it's a business, it's a culture, whatever. Um, and I got some fantastic responses. But what was interesting was that in many cases, while people were happy to share verbally with me, in some cases, one in particular absolutely did not want to be identified and didn't want to put anything in writing. Um, so I tried to reflect a little bit of their lived experiences within my introduction and I'm really grateful then for all the people who followed in the chapter and we have a whole range of experiences from people who have totally rejected marriage, civil partnership, any form of legalised coupling um, because they don't see the need of it to people who are desperately wanting to get married um, or to have some sort of legal relationship and have found so many blockers along the way, whether it was legal, whether it was to do with family or culture or whatever. And then in between that, so many different experiences. And also the other thing was that there are schools, it, it, so much is relevant to schools, but I, I like to think that there are three groups. Very often people think there are two groups of people in school. There's um, the staff, really, really important. Um, and what's a little bit different about this protected characteristic is that um, it, uh, it relates, so you only discriminate against people with this character, it, with it, marriage and civil partnerships in a workplace. So schools could potentially look at it and think, well, this is a, only relates to our staff. But of course it doesn't. Schools have to look at the whole realm of relationships with students. And because of my particular perspective, I want to look at students, what their protective characteristics may be, but also protective characteristics within their families and how that is reflected. So that, I think I'll, I'll, I'll pause there um, to say that that was sort of the, my starting point with this and I think that within the chapter you will see um, lots of different views but common threads and I think there's still much more to be said. Uh, yeah definitely I'm just looking through the chapter contributors and what was brilliant about the way that you've put it all together was I love the quotes that you put at the start so in nine days i'm going to get married and it's about the idea of positive relationships play a really important part and what what does a positive relationship look like um not just through that hetero norm perspective but you know in with that spectrum of perspectives um, and then the chapter it goes from marriage the fairy tale which is looking at sort of how fairy tales and children, what's the narratives that we're telling the girls in particular, but also the boys. And then we've got Claire Price who talks about marriage is a feminist issue and what does that mean to women and that idea of identity and what does it mean? Um, and then Jessica's about the, the, the well, Mrs, Mr, Miss, Mrs, Mrs. It, it, again, it's identity. So the way that you've broken it down um, and brought it back together that you can see that there are common threads coming through the one common thread definitely is relationships but also the idea of what a family is as well um, and, and what that means when it comes to talking about a range of relationships and different relationships so I'm going to go on a bit about mine if that's okay and then Jackie if you want to um, come in again so Jackie had put mine at the beginning of this um, chapter, and I think it's because it starts with that idea of what are we teaching our children from the beginning. Um, and I've said I'm never against marriage or for it. It's just it's a very interesting concept, I think, when you think about it from a historical point of view, because for many women, and it has been touched on, marriage was their license to be able to do things in life. So to have well, to, to, to get some sort of life, really. But then that there's this archetypal story that we tend to tell children, especially with Disney, I wouldn't say Disney now, but Disney from the past, where 
the equilibrium was that the the girl is very passive and she she needs to be saved in some way and it's the man who comes and saves her and there's a lot of gendered assertions that come from that from patriarchy in 19th century well, we call it science but I'll use that term very very loosely and then it goes into that idea of neuroplasticity and sort of getting the children to understand that there are different archetypes and how do we make sure that we model them as humans but also within the classroom within the context I mean coming back to you Jackie what would you say are the threads that you could see running through so I know that I can see families and relationships and what it means but what would you say was the, the major threads coming through for you as you were putting this chapter together? Um, well, I think it's picking up on what you said about this, um, about Disney. I mean, I, I talked about um, my grandson saying, oh, I, in nine days, I'm going to get married. And that conversation went through. And the bit that's not in the chapter was when he was asked, well, where are you going to get married? And it was in Elsa's castle in Frozen. And already you can see the absolute impact. And I, I, I mentioned about um, one person who contacted me um, and she talked about her experience yeah. and the impact that Bollywood had had on her and how she had run off to marry her husband because it had all seemed so romantic um, and how it hadn't worked out. And this, this sort of fairy tale view of marriage and even this year, you know, there was the um, Brooklyn Beckham wedding. And it's all this, these images that, um, that children are bombarded with about what to expect from relationships, from marriage. And much of it is fairy tale. Mm -hmm. um, and some of it is reinforced in school because, um, I mean, I think back to as a languages teacher, how I presented families back in the day and I can remember back in the day whenever I was told and um, don't tell them anything about your family tell them nothing whereas actually when you know staff should be able to share all aspects about their families whatever their families are like so this um, aspect of visibility about different families being represented in um, Bex in her section and um, she put it really well. It's our duty as educators to always present real families and and not even just those families in front of us, um, but to be very aware that the families in front, the students in front of us represent a whole range of families and come from a whole range of relationships. And I, I don't think there's always that visibility and that diversity when you walk into a school and whenever you're thinking about how you would um, uh, look at the curriculum. Um, Hale also said by opening up our classrooms to celebrate a diverse range of relationships and families, we give young people the skills and understanding to thrive in our diverse world. So that, that, was, that was one very, very strong thread that ran through about uh, and, and how we engage students in this and what do we, yeah, and listening to them, that was really, really strong. And then the other aspect was to do with staff and staff feeling that they can be open about their relationships. And also that um, schools are, I was going to say family friendly, but I prefer the life friendly places to work. Um, so whenever we took, you mentioned about maternity and childcare and so on earlier, that that there's a lot of overlap with marriage and civil partnership. With actually, when you drill down into every one of the other protected characteristics potentially, um, and it's it's really sort of that thread of supporting staff, um, in terms of their relationships and their families. And if they choose to be single, being life friendly. So it's, and in doing that, it's opening up to young people that actually being in a relationship may not be the be all and end all for everybody. And um, so moving away from, from those sort of, I don't know, stereotypical images of, of marriage and relationships. 
I think it's diversifying that idea of what a happily ever after is as well, because I think it's yes. very gendered. When you think about Disney, it's very much about marriage and it's very much more about the girl getting married. Um, yes. that, that's your happily ever after, the, the beautiful dress and the day and everything else. And then when you think about the wedding day, which I think sometimes is the issue there. So they want that beautiful wedding day, but then they don't actually think about the marriage that comes after and that relationship that you have with that other person. Yes. Um, so it, it's that, isn't it? It's making sure that we diversify what it means to have a happily ever after. Um, and that's where I think you've touched on it, that as educators, we need to be aware of what we're presenting to the children um, from our point of view. So I'll very happily say I'm single and I'm very happy with that. Whether Prince Charming comes or not is a different thing. But it's that idea of like it's not the be all and end all, like you say, and it's about choice, that it is your choice. It doesn't have to be marriage that isn't success for a woman. It might be for some and that's brilliant but it's not yes. necessarily for all women and it's i think from my experiences in the classroom and it started from early years as well they're very strong um assumptions that children will have from the beginning and it's almost like you need to sort of unpack that as soon as you see it and be very aware of it to things that you know the way the girls that play in the home area but boys will play in construction and then there's parts of the brains that are developing in girls but not in the boys and therefore that's related to behaviors and choices and then it move it like when I had year five and the idea of what a girl was it was very much a Disney princess and they were 10 year old boys and it was scary because that then becomes a schema for them. Um, so I think it's definitely about disrupting it and diversifying what we mean by a relationship, a healthy, happy relationship, and not those stereotypical, gendered, quite limiting perceptions as well sometimes, because that, like you say, it brings in the other protected characteristics as well. So yeah. Jackie, is there anything you'd like to end on? Um, in terms of what you hope that this chapter would enable educators and and IT like early career teachers as well, what what hope do you have? I think there are two key words that come up probably across all the protected characteristics. One is visibility. When um, my grandson's mummies were looking for a, a primary school they wanted you know when they looked around they wanted to see what's on the wall what's being talked about how were they welcomed and um, so what's what's visible whenever you go in i was in a fantastic girls school a few months ago really great girls school and there were lots of quotes you know sort of banners with quotes um as you walked in and every single one was a man and I thought, and, and as soon as we, I, you know, it was mentioned to the head teacher, they were mortified. They really were mortified. And sometimes it's, you know, it's there's a review needed and sometimes it needs external eyes to bring that review in. And it's, it's about belonging and it's about everyone belonging at school. It's about staff feeling that they belong and can share um, what their aspect is. I mean, I love Claire's section where she has totally rejected the idea of needing someone to bring up someone else. But on the other hand, you've got, you know, blended families, you've got children with, you know, step parents, th three double sets of grandparents, all sorts of, of, of relationships there. And it's really just, um, I don't like to use the word normalising because Vivian doesn't like the word normalising. And I, I, I understand that. But maybe usualising the fact that there's all sorts of families. Um, and the other thing is the greater flexibility to get away from it, the intransigence that there is. Um, we've always done things a certain way, therefore we always will. Um, so I think that that's, that's really important. I think the other thing that this chapter does is invite people to be braver as well be brave about what they are sharing and be brave about yes. what they're enabling the children to see as potential. So Jackie, I think that's the perfect place to leave it so we can bring in Yamina yes. and um, and Louise. But thank you so much. And I'm sure I can speak for everyone who was part of our chapter. You were, bit, you were an amazing source of support oh. as well. Really, <laughs> it was really a well. Team. Thank you. Yeah. Right, thank you, Jackie. Okay. Right, we are going to bring in Anne Louise and Yamina. Hello, ladies. Hello. 
Hello. How are we doing? Hello. We're good. We're good. How are you both? Good. good. Yeah. <laughs> in unison. I'm tired and in pain, but anyway, that's. Oh, oh, no. I went to the gym for the first time. Oh, the the that was your first day. problem. That was your first problem. Going no, to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> it's a women only gym, which is great. It's called Stronger. I'd recommend it. Oh, yeah. a, friend, a couple of friends of mine go to a women only gym as well. They were talking about it just two weeks ago. Very and they were just like, just, yeah, yeah, just yeah. they don't have that, you know, that sense of what it is to be a woman in a gym you know you really can look like a tomato and not really care <laughs> terrible isn't it how you need to look like that oh like, so uh, you've got that post gym glow now you mean to see if i'm you fine <laughs> <laughs> all right ladies so we are here to talk about the chapter six and i made sure that it was about the biological terms so people understood what we were talking about um now it's always good I'm to gonna... clarify that first <laughs> um, yeah otherwise that salt and pepper coming on like no no that's not really <laughs> um so and louise we're going to talk about you because it follows quite nicely on from what jackie and i were speaking about in terms of marriage and civil partnerships and looking that idea yep. about that gendered um gender assumptions that come with marriage and what it means for a girl and what it means for a boy yeah. um but you I love your chapter because it was Georgie Porgy if I just say Georgie Porgy and can you explain Georgie Porgy to us please <laughs> um right okay well uh, first that uh, you know coming from a uh, primary background and uh, my school is very EYFS heavy and I just you know taking it from an EYFS point of view an early years point of view nursery rhymes are a massive focus in our day it's kind of everything that we do and um, a couple of years ago when I started teaching 18 months old I had to learn some nursery rhymes again and of course you know they were all coming back from what I was being sung to when I was when I was wee and um, there's honestly, there's more than just Georgie Porgy. I chose Georgie Porgy because it's my dad's name. <laughs> <laughs> but there are so many. Um, there's Miss Polly, even Little Red Riding Hood, if you wanted to go into that, Little Miss Muffet. Um, yeah. But Georgie Porgy, apart from the fact it's my, it's my dad's name, it's so deeply rooted in toxic masculinity. It's incredible. Um, so in my chapter, it's um, Georgie Porgy, Pudding and Pie, Kissed the Girls and Made Them Cry. When the boys came out to play, Georgie Porgy ran away. Um, so Georgie liked to kiss the girls for a start. Did he ask for their consent? No. Uh, did they like it? No. Um, what, what he was doing was extremely wrong. But the other thing is that the other boys came out. He ran away, but nothing ever happened to him. They never got reprimanded in any way. You've got the other boys coming to to save the damsels in distress and all is well with the girls and they can keep going and playing. Um, but what I also talk about is this other message of um, the girls didn't feel empowered enough to do something about it either. So again, we're all waiting for the boys to come out and chase Georgie away. That's kind of the, the subliminal message that I got from that. And I just thought... This is so incredible. So, you know, sort of, of, a, of a nursery rhyme that I was sung to up hundreds of millions of times. My dad, George, all very fun. But then when I read this and, I, and, and then I opened Pandora's box and we've got all these nursery rhymes that are just deep rooted in this portrayal of the weak female, they're servile, they're helpless. I mean, Little Miss Muffet, 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 Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet eating her curbs and whey. Along came a spider and sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. Like, you know, she's obviously not got any, <laughs> any way to, you know, not be frightened of a spider, but mm -hmm. run away from something that's scary rather than confront the spider and squish it or ping it away or do whatever but it's you know I, I, like I said I could go on about nursery I could write another full chapter on nursery rhymes um but working in early years I think we all really need to take that very seriously and really play back in our minds what are we singing to these kids can we change anything small or can we take it away Georgie Porgy is now removed from from any any songs that will take part in, in my school um, but, you know, even Miss Polly, 
can we replace the pronouns in Miss Polly? You know, it's something as simple as that, that, that we can all take action on. Mm -hmm. So that was the yeah. nursery rhyme one. Well, yeah, and just following on from that, you talk about, child, yeah, with the, the idea of um, sort of jobs that are associated with boys and with girls, so changing mm. the in one of them so it's a girl rather than the boy and things like that. So it, And I think the thing that came through about that was that, that it's such a simple thing that you tend to do as a early years practice anyway, but mm -hmm. are we aware of what we're actually telling the children are we aware of what we're saying to them because that's what they're internalizing and yeah. then ends up sort of playing out as well in their their their, their play and yeah. um, it then becomes for them normal that's normal behavior um yeah and yeah and then they'll start screaming and going oh there's a spider someone help me please you know things like that the, the girls will do and you know the boys laugh and think it's funny but it comes from somewhere and adults have a massive role in how children see and portray the world around them uh, so from a from a very early age i think educators really need to take that into account mm, i think it definitely it comes down to expectation doesn't it that it's the expectations that we have of the children regardless of gender should be the same and it's mm -hmm. about empowering them and um, and you talk but you talk about teaching them about consent and how important that is and you link it back to the un conventions of the rights of a child which i think should be in every classroom to be honest yeah. because they need to know their rights absolutely <laughs> and it's that idea of objectifying because that's what it is that's what that it's a very simple nursery rhyme but the amount of damage that it can actually mm -hmm. you're considering why you why you're using that one um and that's then it. you talk about me too and believing narratives as well so can you just touch a bit about that as well yeah and i'll go back i mean i'll just benny kind of took that from me because she mentioned that about um, believing what you're being told as truth. It's not the truth necessarily, as we know mm -hmm. from recent um, uh, recent trials involving uh, A-list celebrities. It's not about, um, you know, uh, someone comes to me and tells me this has happened. Safeguarding has been an issue. It might not be the truth, but it is truth for their experience. And I think that uh, even with children, it's, it's such a young age they come to me and they would say something like oh my dad hit me they might he might not have but they've perceived that that that's happened for example and that that is very very common um my own son did it to me actually he went to school one day and told his teacher that i'd hit him and i hadn't <laughs> and i'm going the little but because <laughs> what <laughs> because he's felt that i obviously was angry at him the day before I'd maybe shouted at him and he's felt heart so then they replace the heart with smacking or hitting so what i'm kind of getting at here is that you've got to trust what they're saying as their truth um and and take that into account and especially as an as an adult knowing that you have high expectation of your child but knowing that they are competent individuals who are able to tell you their truth and knowing that as an adult is so is so incredibly powerful I completely agree. And I will say in terms of a safeguarding issue and some of the um, awful stories that have come out about child abuse and things like that as well, it's that idea of this is their truth. We need to be in a culture where we do listen to children and we do understand that their voices are very, very important because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I won't mention celebrities and names, things like that, but it, it's that, isn't it? That if we're, we're trying to keep our children safe, we need to listen to them. And yes, you have behaviours that will tell you that's the way of them communicating, but it's that idea that what you've just said, and louise that it's their truth and Absolutely. it's important that we listen to them. Thank you for that. Um, Yamina, I'm going to go to you. We're sort of looking at the, uh, the other side, really, and that's what's great about these chapters, that it, it, they are spectrums of people's stories that so that brings in um, insight for us, but also the idea of how we see this protected characteristics from different perspectives. So your chapter talks about wom womanhood and motherhood in education mm -hmm. um, and that idea, and it is so true still. Um, and I still have these, well, it, it makes me cringe now, but uh, you're at a stage where you can sort of challenge it. Um, society is obsessed with women and their choices, and we've seen it with the abortion um, mm -hmm. laws and things in America at the moment as well, that it, it is astonishing that it is still so much that women's rights are that they, they seem to be well they don't seem to be ours sometimes 
So would you um, mind just talking a bit about your chapter? And um, yes, if you talk about your chapter, you mean? I think it's such a huge thing that I tried to talk about. And since writing the chapter, actually, a lot of people have come to me and said, well, why didn't you write about this and this and this? Because to be a woman in education, there are so many different aspects of our, our identity um, and so many different aspects of our experiences that just can't be talked about in a thousand word chapter. And so mm -hmm. when I was really thinking about this chapter, I had a discussion with Hannah Wilson and really thought about what is it that's my experience and the, the community that I've grown up with and their experiences. And essentially it was about choices and about how every choice that I've ever made in my life from when I was a child was sometimes was mostly made by others and that's not to tarnish anything that my family did or my the community I've grown up with it's just the way it was and it was just accepted and I think only recently because of women it actually have I started to really question that and it's really feel very empowered to be able to question those choices um so you know when I was when I was, I'm thinking about myself you know in the lead up to getting married and, and not being married until I was 29 was a big deal um, for people, particularly within my community. You know, lots of my friends were getting married a lot earlier and everyone was questioning me, aren't you going to get married? Oh, it's because you're too career minded. Like literally I put that in the in there because it was a quote. People, just, you're too career minded. You're too focused on climbing up the leadership ladder. All you care about is, you know, going through education, but you know, education is not going to keep you warm. And, you know, you need a husband and all of those sorts of assumptions are constantly being questioned. And not just by my family, not just by my, but actually even in the workplace, which I think was the most shocking part because it was quite a distant, it was a, meant to be a professional environment. And I found that those, those really really got to me but I never spoke about it and actually writing this chapter has made me really think about those experiences question those experiences and and how bias has really just permeated our workplace to the point where we don't question them anymore mm -hmm. and I think you know really looking at those those organizations that are helping women to thrive in the workplace whether they're mothers or whether they're not mothers was really important for me so part of what I did was go in and ask lots and lots of lots and lots of women essentially about their own experiences and you know both whether they were single whether they were married whether they were parents whether they were on their IVF journey whether whatever it was I tried to find as many women as I could to talk to and actually some men because I think they're part of this journey and this experience too and to ask them what has been your experience so somebody I spoke to said oh because I'm single I think that's why I got promoted over my colleague and acknowledging that saying they said to me it's because you know I was very unlikely to go and have babies because of particularly within my culture you know you get married you, there's a particular way of doing things so they just made that assumption that she would what because she was not married she's not going to go off anytime soon off a of maternity and and that's why she'd been promoted and she was able to acknowledge that and was actually told that to a colleague who she acknowledged was far more experienced but because that pet person was a mother was then not given that opportunity for a promotion and we think that because we've got flexible working practices and because we're talking about part-time and all of these things that that doesn't exist anymore but we know that twitter the people on twitter is a minority of what's actually happening in education and i think that's the key thing that we need to really think about is it's great to have uh, essentially some sort of an echo chamber if we've mm -hmm. curated our, our twitter sphere but actually, is that really truly reflective of what's happening in our organisations? And what I found really interesting since the book has come out is colleagues, people coming up to me, and not just within my organisation, but outside, saying, oh, you know, that's really shocking what happened to you in those schools, and making an assumption that it wasn't happening in their schools, you know? And actually, it's, it's really thinking about what are we doing to challenge those? How mm -hmm. have we really done the groundwork to find out through staff voice what is happening and the experiences of our, of our colleagues. So again, lots of this has happened since writing the chapter. One of my uh, friends who I did my PGC with actually DM me on Instagram said, I think the book is brilliant, but I wish you could have written about how since I've come back from maternity leave, you know, I've been asked to do a TLR and I get paid for only half of that TLR because I'm in for three days, but I'm doing the majority, I'm doing all of that job, like I'm doing it. So what about that? And I said to her, you know, I would have loved to write about that because that's really important. It's not my experience as of yet, but I, I know lots of women, including my sisters, who have been through that. And so how are we really 
really exploring that in our organizations so things like staff voice can really help with that and i talk about having spaces and forums safe spaces and forums so my current organization my head teacher does a drop-in so every tuesday and thursday from eight o'clock to eight thirty, anyone can drop in and talk to her so you've got actual direct access to your the head of the school to the head teacher to be able to explore those sorts of things so i know and then sorry i'm talking about but um i know for example when I, my mum was really unwell, she, you know, she was diagnosed with leukemia, going to her and having that direct access to say, look, you know, there's caregiving responsibilities here now. And it means that I don't need to be flexible. You, I need, I'm asking for flexible working. And actually at my last school, when my dad was ill as well, you know, asking them, this is what's happening. Can I go part time? And them just saying, yeah, of course you can. And acknowledging and valuing that. And I think so much of that is because we don't have access to our direct, you know, to our head teachers who make those decisions or the governors who really can impact on our work life balance and actually our our experiences in school as women particularly but also women who are going through different experiences including through motherhood i think yeah it's really important what you said about that idea of having that um that that channel really to voice your voice and say what you need um i think we touched on it last week with teach like a queen though i think some women don't have aren't empowered enough yet to mm -hmm. ask what they need and so the, the, there's a culture change as well that needs to be shifted so that women and men to be fair especially when come to paternity you think about how shocking paternity is for men um we need to start questioning it and you made a really good point in your chapter about instead of scrutinizing women scrutinize the policies instead and i thought that was really really powerful because that's that's essentially where the power lies really isn't it so i mean have you seen any examples of where that has i know there was a, an amazing blog out this week um yeah women ed blog about the fact that she'd gone for a position where she thought maybe she would get it she wouldn't get it because she was pregnant um, and the policies changed the ceo of that trust changed the policy to enable her to be a mother as well as work with her dream role so have you seen any examples of that since writing your chapter I think particularly, I've got to say, the work that's been done by, I think it's called, she's called Fertility in Workplace, particularly because that's something that does impact on me and p p colleagues I know. She's done phenomenal work on getting us to really understand and scrutinise those policies, those medical leave policies that are deciding whether women who are going through fertility, you know, what that, and really questioning that. And actually, well, the other question that's come out of that is, who's writing those policies? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's men writing those policies who have no idea about the medical leave um, that women need, and and there's so much being at MT, you know, MTPT are doing some fantastic work as well. I know they've got a course going around fam life friendly um, policies, and and really there's so much out there, but I just don't think it's hitting all the right places. If that makes sense, I do think still medical leave policies are very critical um, in defining whether women get paid. So if you're going through a fertility treatment, and for example, there are women who have to have scans every other day, they might mm -hmm. not get paid for that through no fault of their own, because they're still doing the work, and just that life has had different plans for them. So what, are we going, what we're doing is, as an organization, what scrutinizing them, mm -hmm. and, and we wouldn't do that if somebody was going, you know, was pregnant. So why are we doing that to women who are going through fertility treatments, for example, or having to go to the hospital because they're pregnant? You know, all of these things again got, comes back to the intersectionality of of identity. Really. Um, and I just don't think enough is being done um, to really support effective medical leave policies. And I just think sometimes. We leave those things. We write them and then we leave them. And we forget about them. And you know, Mary might talks about values should be laminated, shouldn't be laminated. They should be lived. And I think that ha that's the same with policies as well. They shouldn't just be written. You know, here's our medical leave policy. It says this is going to happen. And then when it comes to that individual personal experience, we say, well, look, in our policy it says this, but that might not have been considered by the person who wrote that policy. So how many at different layers is that being scrutinised? Um, you know, is it just that person writing the policy? Is the head teacher looking at it? Are a range of women and a range of people getting to have their have a look at that policy before it then goes to governors and it gets ratified? You know, all of those processes. How many of us really know about those processes in schools as well? How a policy becomes 
action how do we do we know about those and i think that is about empowering um, and providing spaces to have those discussions we do lots of working parties for metacognition teaching and learning behavior what about those policies you know i know for example i wrote the um, sre policy at my last school and it was scrutinized and by lots of different people so it wasn't just left to me on my own to decide it it was looked at by lots and lots of people is that the same and is that the case for all of those different policies that affect every single person in, in that workplace I, I'm not sure it is yeah I think you're right in the sense that it's it, the fact that you need those diverse voices to come because that's what this policy is affecting all those diverse people in your organization so if, yeah it's it's that understanding of how it affects different people in different ways um both of your chapters definitely for me um it's that idea of voice of challenging the norms use that very loosely because I don't like the fact that they're norms um but challenging and having that voice to say no or challenge in the sense of questioning it so I'm going to ask you both a key question from your chapters no pressure <laughs> but as, as she opens the book and tries to paint her chapter <laughs> <laughs> so how will so and Louise how will you imagine you you will want answering. How will you reach out to the school community to continue challenging these stereotypes and bringing about wider change to benefit young girls in finding their voice? So I know we have things like alternative fairy tales and having SRE lessons, I think, is essential to this so that we're opening a safe space for children to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. But how else can we reach the community? And I'm talking about families, I'm talking about stakeholders. Well, I think the first thing to do is get them into your schools as much as you can. Uh, restrictions have been lifted quite substantially in the last few months here in Spain. And um, we're getting our parents back into the schools so that they can really see what's going on. Get them to come in for stay in plays. And, and that's when the teacher is modelling the expectation for, for our kids, that they are modelling the role play that is... Um, you, that's got the construction but the, the girls are there and the boys are there and, and the, the teacher is modeling that kind of behavior that that gives girls the, the empowerment to, the, to feel empowered to go there. Um, it might be that they need to be guided there by the teacher but the teachers are making that effort in front of the parents to show what it means to to guide them away from these gender stereotypes. So first and foremost get the parents back in and get them doing stays and plays. And then it's about training teach, uh, parents as well. That means that, you know, you're holding training sessions, twilight sessions, but you're, you're getting the parents to come as well. Uh, if you're doing a twilight session or a CPD session on gender stereotypes, invite them along. Look, we're doing this as part of our CPD. Who would like to come? And then also offering parent... Um, parent sessions where it's parents are invited. We're doing a session on gender stereotypes. We're doing a session on uh, nursery rhymes. Um, please come along and they're invited to, um, you know, a, a 30 minute um, training session with Q's and E's. So it's really, it really getting that involvement, um, increasing the involvement and also listening to them as well when they have problems or concerns, because they do. And um, the, there's a lot of parents that are not ready to go on that journey yet. And I think the other side of that coin is that schools are, shouldn't be there to, to force it on them either, but rather listen, have respect and, um, and accept that they are not there yet and not try to, to change them. And I think that's, that's where you need to find a really crucial balance between school and community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that respectful idea as well of that everyone's voices is included. Thank you, Aunt Louise. Um, and Yamina, how far have you considered the voices of women at different stages of their career in creating policies to ensure that there is no motherhood tax? But then we can talk about age and menopause. I mean, that's part of a woman's Menstruation. Journey. Yeah, Absolutely. as well. So it's... Ha and they're, they're, I don't know if we can still call them taboo. I think many women are now using their voices to sort of open up this discussion because there's nothing to be ashamed of with any of it. Um, but it's almost like that projection of the man because he felt uncomfortable about it. So therefore, that's what's being projected into these policies. <laughs> My, I don't know. I agree with what I'm saying. Um, I think so it's about 
create sorry Kieran I think it's about creating spaces so like at Sarah Bernal where Nick Bentley and I are what we've done in Hannah Malik is launch the diverse educators and manifesto book club and so we're creating those spaces and we're then going up to people and inviting them because sometimes people don't feel like and colleagues might not feel like it's the right space for them and that's why we have to go and do the job of actually inviting people saying look you know we're going to be discussing this chapter like last week discussed the disability chapter before that it was the gen you know really actually set going to people saying hey we're going to be discussing this chapter would you like to come and join sharing that with slts and asking them to be part of that because and and really nothing will change in an organization until senior leaders and the governors really get involved and so i think you know that book club is starting to really get the discussion going about and and really exploring that but then what we do is in in briefing we'll share our discussion points mm -hmm. and then say hey here's some things that we think we should talk about let's go and do the job of, of really doing the groundwork and really doing something about this now um and i think that that's a really important space and forum to do that but while also promoting the book which is great <laughs> um because you know we're not just talking about sex we're talking about all those protected characteristics so that every member of our of, our, of the workplace feels valued and feels safe and that psychological safety is key and it can only happen if, if we build trust i think and and i think also you know what my head teacher is doing at sarah Bernal, you know those head teacher droppings are also creating that kind of direct access to her to be able to share people people can then share their experiences and the, the direct needs that they have this is what I've, i'm going through this is the way in which I'd like to be helped, essentially, rather than making the assumption about women and their choices, mm. let's ask them, you know, this is what's happening. How can I help you as a leader to really support you as you're going through this experience, whether it's positive or, or not so positive, whatever it is, how can we help? And that question is, how can we help? Because I think at how we provide those safe spaces and those forums for, for our colleague and every member of the workplace too, not just teaching staff. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I th yeah, and I think it's that idea of actually saying to the woman, you do have a voice and you do have a choice. So tell us what you what you would prefer. <laughs> I love yeah. that line. It's great. It's That's great. I love it. So good. <laughs> this was brilliant. Thank you so much, ladies. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Right. We are See you yeah, soon. fabulous. See you soon. Thank you very much, ladies. Um, right. I'll be honest, I need to just quickly charge my laptop. So I'm going to come off for a little bit and then come back on and then we'll be speaking to um, Julie, who was part of the disability um, disability chapter. So, I mean, and Louise, unless you want to stay on and have a little chat with uh, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> but go, go. I, I mean, I can do something. I can maybe sing a song right. or... <laughs> I'm just going to quickly, because otherwise it's going to cut out. So I'm just going to... Go and plug it in. Go and plug it in. We'll have a chat. Hi, Julie. Hi, Louise. How are you? All right. How are you? That was amazing, everything you were saying. Oh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your yours chapter. as well. Yeah, yours as well. My goodness. I loved it. It's really great. And I think, well, as we know, mental health and, and mental illnesses, it's such a really important thing to be talking about, as, as always. I mean, I think it's really, really important. Yeah, I feel like there's been a revolution over the past four or five years. Um, I've reflected um, an awful lot, considering that something was that was I was considered was a dark secret that I was never able to reveal till only a few years ago. It's now openly. Um, it's 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 great, and I do think that we do need to share that that, that mm -hmm. it's really positive now that conversations mm -hmm. are taking place in all forums, social media, staff rooms. I remember when I took up my deputy headship. I chose that I was going to be really open about my condition. And I remember just airing in the staff room, and this was only about three or four years ago. Um, I just said it out loud, just to yeah. mention my condition and, you know, you know, appointments that I've attended in the past, mentioned the word yeah. psychiatric. That was a word you couldn't yeah. say, wasn't it, five no, years ago? No way. And I just said, you know, and I just remember the room going quiet and everyone staring at me. And then it was, and then it just turned into this, whew, like it was a sense yeah. of relief that I knew right. other people were going to come and tell me their stories and it opened up yes. a forum. And then it just spiraled from there in terms of having discussions. Um, That's that it. How powerful is that? That's incredible. Seriously, that is really incredible, Julie. It's so powerful because as soon as you mention it as a leader, then people are like, oh, I can see that too. 
you know i always said um, my vision is that someone should be able to sit in the staff room and say they've got an appointment with a psychiatric nurse or yeah. a psychiatrist in the same way that anyone with diabetes would talk about theirs or an asthma or somebody yeah. that's to ear nose and throat yeah. the, that that was my vision and i've certainly created that in my school for all oh amazing um, that is wonderful i've got goose pumps Honestly, yeah. <laughs> honestly, it's really powerful. Well, thank you. I'm going to pass you back over to Keen. We did all right in the end. We did all right. Lovely to thank chat you. to you, Julie. Good luck. Bye. Take care. Bye, Louise. Bye. Thank you, Ann Louise. <laughs> right, Julie. It's so Hi, how are you? Good I'm to see you again. I know, yeah. This is our first proper chance to talk, actually. <laughs> sort of face to face. Um, I was listening into what you were saying to Anne Louise, and I think it's incredible that we have leaders like you, and hopefully there'll be more of you soon, sort of those trailblazer leaders. Um, Ruth, unfortunately, can't join us today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because Ruth Golding was the chapter editor, so I'm going to talk a bit about what she had put together um, and sort of like what I've taken from what she did. And then, Julie, I'm going to move to you about your part in the chapter. Is that OK? Yeah, perfect. Perhaps. So chapter two in the Diverse Manifesto is about disability and Ruth Golden was the chapter editor. Um, and I'm just going to sort of quote her to begin with. And then Julie, if you want to come in with your um, points as well, that'd be brilliant. So disability is as varied as the individuals who identify as disabled. Um, and, re and I think that links back to this idea and you touched on it as well, that representation is the precursor to inclusivity. Unless we see or hear these diverse stories from these diverse people how can inclusion happen really because we don't know what we're meant to be including so one fifth of the uk population have a disability um based on the ons data from 2019 and that to me that struck me because I, I thought that's the, that's a, a large proportion of our society then when actually it brings in that idea of hidden disability which i suppose is what you will talk about um, and so how do we ensure that we are not ableist? Because that's that's the thing that will come through, that hidden disabilities as well as any other disability, they are part of that human being. And it's, again, I want to use the word taboo, but it's also like there is nothing wrong with that person, that there is nothing wrong with them. And I think that's a, a conversation that needs to be had about perceptions as well. So I don't know if you want to touch on that, Julie, to begin yeah. with. Yeah, so... Um... Like you were saying, uh, particularly with hidden disabilities, or I'd first like to say, I don't know if she's listening, but Ruth was absolutely amazing. There was a team of us and we got together regularly by Zoom and she was really inspiring. There were times when we were really struggling to to write and get out what we really wanted to say. Um, and we all, we all reflected, and it was quite humorous that we all actually, our first drafts for not all of us, but for a couple of us was just a rant <laughs> about how we felt. And, and it was, we all reflected that although it wasn't the first polished, um, ready to publish item, it was actually the stage that we had to go through to be able to write the edition that got published um, because we needed to kind of self counsel, if you like, some of the annoyances maybe that we've had in terms of how we'd individually been treated or um, etc and Ruth really supported us with that and was really gentle through that process um, in allowing us to go through that phase in terms of getting our art so I, I, I just want to say and I think from anybody who wrote within that chapter would say she was honestly she was so good really really informative really supportive in where you could get literature from and we all all had to cut our words down quite a bit and she was really good in helping us to edit and cut etc so um thank you Ruth if you are listening I'm sure she'll catch up if she's yeah, not thank you Ruth. I know she's on the way she's on the way she's on I think she's on the train yeah yeah on the train on. there she is <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um, that's the first bit but in terms of yeah you've got whether regardless of disability um whether it's hidden or not hidden you know it's about that yeah. creating safe space for people to share their stories and um, I actually learned this from Angela Brown, Hannah, you know, Penny, um, through her work with Lifter, you know, that um, individual stories of, of other human beings is important. And it's an important, you, you have to, this, everybody has a story to tell. Um, and I always connect that with behavior as communication as well. Um, and that actually creating a space, I only said this the other day when I was asked, how do you engage parents? It doesn't matter. As a leader, if you need to engage anybody, you create relationships first, 
you create safe psychological spaces for people to think, actually, I think I can talk to her about something. Um, and in that way, any form of, you know, ism is, is you're going to find a space that people will talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, but with mental health, um, the stigma, you know, years ago in itself was disabling. And I, I quote the words in the book about the torment of being silenced was probably that, you know, I can't even get through without feeling the emotion still pains um, within that when I was diagnosed, it was by far five years of the most difficult time of my whole life. Um, and I wasn't allowed to talk about it. And, you know, um, and that was encouraged by people you loved, by professionals. And with people you loved, it wasn't because they were ashamed. It was just that's what they were taught. And um, this isn't something you talk about. Um, and it was a form of protection so that others don't judge. Where with professionals, I'm not really sure what the agenda was. I highly respect doctors and psychologists and and, and I would certainly not say that my, my experiences reflect what's today, but my experiences were horrific. Um, I still have quotes in my head of some of the things that were said to me, and often my illness was reflected as something I caused upon myself. Because I was very young, I was 20 to 25, and it was, it was sort of, well, if you hadn't have done this or crossed this path or, you know, and maybe if you weren't so anxious about things and... Um, so there was just, it was a dark room. And I remember going to bed one night saying, I just wish someone would take my hand and just take me out and just show me the light. I remember really thinking about that. So that's something I think that is a positive. I think that that doesn't seem to be the case today. And I think that's a real movement forward because that in itself, and I wrote some key words, silenced causes torment, which causes dehumanization which then creates a sense of self-loathing that you will never cure. The self-loathing never leaves you. When you have been dehumanized to a point where you don't feel you monster, it's like you're, you're created to be a monster, you will never cure that. And that's one thing in my legacy as a teacher, a leader, as a mom, in everything I do, I will never dehumanize another being ever. To, to do what, what happened to me or any other form of ism that people carry out. So that's... Thank you. Um, I think <coughs> what you're saying there, and I think what the chapter does really, really well, um, is that idea that it is very dark. I think with mental health, it, it's a dark place. But what from what you're saying is that a lot of people, even professionals, seem to be in the dark about mental health. And therefore, the only way they seem to be dealing with it is by keeping that person in the dark about it as well. And that's where misunderstandings start to brew. That's where lack of understanding leads to this idea of dehumanising someone because you're not being understood. Um, so I think what this chapter does really well um, is giving a voice to the ignored, the overlooked and all the misunderstood. And that's what Ruth definitely puts forward in the, um, oh, you've got me there. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely puts forward in the chapter um, and this idea about definitions and terminology as well about this idea of identity first language which I thought was really really powerful um, embracing their their disabled identity and highlighting the view that, so, that society is the disabling factor and I think you've touched on it there that actually if society understood what you were going through and had that education which I think this chapter does really really well maybe and I'd like to hope that your experience wouldn't be lived by other people or, or wouldn't have been lived by you because it's that idea of it's it is part of you I think this is part of being a human some people will will not have that experience but others do and it's it's a valid experience and it's you're a valid human being at the same time so I think that was that came through really strongly with the chapter and um, the way that she'd written the introduction and this um, I think it hit me really, really hard as well in the sense that this chapter invites you to confront your own ableist um, thinking, which I think a lot of people have without realising. And it's this idea that it's going to make you uncomfortable if you're thinking and you're being self-aware to the point it should make you feel uncomfortable. And that's where you're going to start to do the work. Um, and she goes on to point out that ableist thinking is pervasive and you see that in spaces as well just the idea of you know it, are these buildings wheelchair friendly i mean that's that's a, that's something that's becoming 
more in in the public sphere but it's just one thing it's not i mean it's tip of the iceberg really accept that you're ableist so that again would make people uncomfortable but learning and i think it comes back to your experience about the idea that were you even given the opportunity to learn about what you were going through because obviously the professionals around you didn't seem to enable that learning for you. I must so, add, and I feel awful, the, the turning point for me was a professional, and I apologise. Yeah. I had a psychiatric nurse. Um, I became a mum, and then I had a psychiatric nurse um, who worked with me for a one year. And, yes, that was the turning point. She, she, as our teaching assistants to teachers are equally as amazing, she wasn't um, qualified to deliver um, cognitive behaviour therapy but she certainly knew what she was doing. And now I've, now I've self-taught myself so much in order to help others. And I've learned a lot. I've, I've, I've self-read about my condition. Um, so, but yeah, I was given that opportunity when um, a psychiatric nurse, yeah. So my, my most critical, and I will say this, n knowing my illness now, it was never as severe as I was made to feel it was. It got out of control because of how I was treated and how I was, was dehumanized and wasn't able to learn to recognize my illness to be able to treat it. Um, but yeah, education around your illness and, and educating others is pivotal. And she taught my family as well. Um, there was all these, she's never gonna be able to have a career. She's gonna need a care all her life. I was on suicide watch for six months. Um, and it was, um, and all of that reflecting right back was all to do with more. I was a very, very young person. I didn't even realize until I had my own children in their 20s that I was still just a child. <laughs> They're so young. Um, battling with that alone, um, that's what made the illness spiral out of control. The illness itself, I live with, I've got OCD and post trauma stress disorder. It's, it's not curable, um, but it's definitely very manageable. As you can see, I live a very normal life. Um, so, yeah. I think the idea that comes through there is this idea of self-regulating as well, thinking of being aware about your thoughts and things like that as well. And I think you, CBT, from what I understand, is cognitive behavioural therapy, isn't it? So I'll ask you to touch a bit on that as well, because that's one of the um, one of the things that you say that you, you should do. You should learn about things like that. Um, but then it's this idea as well about disability allyship. We understand what allyship means in terms of race and gender, he for she and things like that. But it's also about that disability allyship. So I think you've touched on it there a bit um, with the lady that enabled you. And you've all, you've been really open already. So I want to say thank you for that, because I think that in itself is, is role modelling. Being authentic and being your authentic self will help others, because I'm hoping people will identify with hopefully what they're going through with what you're saying. Um, so you talk very openly about your mental health in your chapter. So I want to say thank you for that because not everyone would be brave enough to do that. Um, you talk about having adverse child experiences. Um, you touch on self-determination theory, which I want to touch on you a bit more about as well. So those that haven't read the chapter or the book yet understand what that is. Um, and this idea about competence, autonomy and connection and belonging. So those were the key things that sort of moved you forward from what I've read. Um, and I think you probably do this in your organisation, but effective organisational behaviour as well. So if we go back to self-determination theory, can you just explain what that is, please? Yeah, so um, um, a previous employment, I wanted to go and analyse why, because when COVID came about, um, the, the the rise in sort of teachers or professionals working in education. I always say school staff because it's equally tough for everybody and everyone's doing an amazing job. So, you know, the people's mental health. Now, I need to be careful with the language. So you've got mental health illness, you've got which are diagnosed conditions, which some can be biological and some can have environmental factors that have gone on to create and some you don't know because even with mine, I think it's a mixture. Um, and then you have mental health illness glitches if you like so a bereavement and now I'm in, you know and it's clear what's caused it my mental health is not in a good place but it might not necessarily be an illness at the moment it's because something has impacted my well-being um, so you've got to kind of be quite as a leader you should definitely be aware of those differing factors and then there's what people are promoting now well-being um, now well-being if you as a leader support well-being you're taking consideration of 
minimizing risk factors to people gaining mental health. And I think the mental health in education, the DfE guidance in 2018 is such a good document. Um, and I think although that's reflected on children, it lists protective factors and risk factors that I think all professionals should know. Um, so coming back to that, when I kind of looked back on my um, journey from teacher to assistant head in, my, in a school in London, I thought, well, how did I manage this illness as well as I did compared to how other people are struggling? And then I kind of went back and reflected on the provisions, if you like, or, or how the, the leadership structure and organisation of the school was um, and listed the things that I've mentioned in the book. And then when I went on to do an MSc module that looked at structural organisation um, in terms of it was to do with professional learning and getting the best out of people, we studied the theory. Now, and as I was writing this chapter, I was studying that module. So I must say I haven't studied it as it's, it's a grey area now because I studied it a long time ago. But it generally means that you apply three factors within your organisational structure in everything you do. And it's um, making sure that, and I do this for pupils and staff, that everybody has an auton has autonomy. And I heard in the previous um, talk that there was a discussion around policies. All policies in my school go top down. They go, we draft them, they then go down to staff and then they get discussed, they get edited and then they come back and they go through that process. Uh, and that's autonomy. And then I always say, you know, offer people leadership opportunities to kind of jump on board an aspect of that if they've got a passion, et cetera. Um, and there's lots and lots of examples of autonomy. Uh, you know, I feel that we all drive the school forward. Um, a sense of belonging, and that's looking at the Equality Act, that's looking at um, making sure that people feel a sense of belonging. From the minute I've said in school often, um, from the minute you cross over this threshold into this building, you need to feel that you belong here. And if there are practices, principles or policies that don't make you feel that way, we need a discussion immediately because that's pivotal. Um, and then a sense of purpose. People need a sense of purpose. And this kind of comes into that conversation around intrinsic and I can't remember those two terms, but those Excellent. two yeah, yeah. Um, motivation. And a, a lot of the research says that having, you know, a sense of purpose. Um, so when I'm coming in, you know, that kind of links to your moral purpose. It, it, it links to making sure that people know that when you did this, it had this impact. And I, as the head teacher, I recognize that. And that process happens regularly. Um, so those three things um, on a deep level of consideration within your policies, within your professional learning, within your CPD, within your well-being, within your work-life balance, in everything that you're thinking of that you're responsible for as a head teacher, how do those three elements continuously run through? Now, am I perfect at it? I've only been ahead for 18 months, so definitely not. But one thing I will say, and I think staff would would vouch, is that my door's open. And if they're feeling any, you know, in any way uncomfortable or feeling um, that I haven't done something in the in the way that they feel that they can have a conversation with me. Um, and as long as I can and rationalise it, you know, changes will be made via staff voice. And if I can't, a damn good rationale is shared with them so that they still feel heard. Yeah. And that's that's SDT. That's that's um, self-determination theory in a very small. I mean, it's a massive, massive psychological theory. So. I think what's great is the fact that how you're um, implementing it into practice. I think that's the powerful thing. It's all well and good reading about things, but it's, it's how you implement it and how that would impact the human experience, that lived experience of the people in your school. Um, you talk about that idea of um, yeah, improving motivation and well-being in the workplace because of it, and that idea of neuroplasticity as well. So, are you enabling them to sort of not necessarily change mindset, but change behaviours to enable them to think more positively? Is that that's the outcome of all of it, isn't it? Yeah. So again, a huge theory, but neuroplasticity, which is something I studied, because I'm always trying to get better within my condition, and I've you know I've accepted that there are um, areas that will never change, and, I, and you know somebody who's got you know, disabilities that are visible disabilities will know that, okay, so I've got hearing loss. There are certain things I'm just never going to be able to do. And I've accepted that. But there are elements, you know, brain 
plasticity is all about that that traumas or um, difficulties that you have faced that they are repairable with certain philosophies and exercises etc um, but having a good understanding of that can enable you again to put policies and practices in place that enable people to overcome um, that that's more connected to post-trauma um, and recovery from post-trauma um, and that's a theory I tend to study a lot in terms of pupils because that's something I wouldn't say staff are so forthcoming to share it's not to say that I don't have staff that probably have incurred traumas um, but that's something I think is still something that people don't tend to talk so openly about and again there's so much I don't know where it stems from and I have spoken about this at work in terms of when we listen to our families and pupils there is such this resistance to appreciate a lived experience and I'm not sure if that stems from our ability to be uncomfortable with the world we live in and, and recognize that actually the world does have these negative aspects and this want to be overly positive and see the world in in a way that sometimes there is great aspects of the world and I'm certainly not saying we should all go to bed and I think doom but to have a wonderful world we need to accept that there's negativity that we need to do better at like you would in any organization that you're trying to to lead and there is so much resistance to listening and I always say listen more talk less I think it's that idea of being and when a parent yeah. comes in with a complaint or when something you know I, I honestly pen paper and just listen any if they raise their voices or whatever and just allowing them the space to to air out everything they tend to then self-regulate and then say actually I'm not sure this you, you know or just allow people to tell their stories and believe their stories we you know in, in everything we do we see the worst in people you know in in absence management it's because people are lazy because people this and that there's a, there's a real drive to see the wrong in people and that bothers me greatly i yeah. think it's that idea of what um you mean i was talking about as well that you've just touched on but is it that idea of there might be shame associated with it or is there the lack of boundaries could that come into play there so or also just feeling comfortable about how they're feeling so they tend to go to the default of anger which would then make someone uncomfortable so it's within that there's within like there's darkness isn't there and I think that's what we need to touch on that there's there in terms of balance to have the light you need the darkness as well and it's how we navigate towards that darkness in the most positive way um but I want to finish with this question with you because I think it touches on what you're saying and hopefully you can share how you role model and how you would answer it so how can you challenge mental health microaggressions um being used in your school for protecting the dignity of those disabled with mental health. So I'll finish with that one. That's a really interesting, um, really interesting conversation. And I was, I talked to someone on LinkedIn about this recently. Um, so say now I've got OCD, I hear a lawful lot all over, oh, that's the OCD in me or, you know, and I can only ever speak for myself that actually that's considered a microaggression. But when I hear it, it makes me smile. And it makes me smile because someone has labelled themselves with a condition that I was fearful to talk about many, many years ago. So in a, in a way, hearing someone say that is acceptance. I don't see it as derogatory for me. And I can only ever talk. Everybody has their own experiences. I've accepted the conditions. I embrace the condition. Um, and having an understanding that OCD isn't just about washing hands as well. It, it's it's being obsessive about a compulsion. And for me, it's all in the mind and it's thoughts. It's nothing to do with washing hands and nothing to do with cleaning. Um, but yeah, everyone's, yeah, the OCD isn't just, that's just the common one that gets discussed. But for me, um, in terms of, in, in everything that we've promoted in our school, in terms of the Equality Act, um, we haven't we're, we're going into our second stage so we've got equity on our school development plan and at the moment it's been curriculum looking at the curriculum looking at how we market our school in terms of representation um, um, but now we're moving into digging into it deeper and looking at all of the language that's accompanied and I think the most important thing as a school leader to have these conversations and reinforcement so I use my social media I use when I'm 
leading on insets or is to continuously and now staff recognize that this is the culture of the school and this is important this is where we're going forward so an example of that is you know i was really proud that they're starting to notice those aspects in our school that aren't right so an example of that is the administrator said that um oh um our logo isn't representative of our community and and, and of this equity that we're moving forward that the children were all white which when the logo was created back many 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 years ago that would have been the population of the children um and we don't represent disability or etc now that came from the administrator which then stemmed to you we've now got um, somebody in a wheelchair on our logo we've got it you, our logo is now multicultural and then you upload that onto the website to say this is our culture this is how we're moving forward and then that generates people to then self-study themselves and to explore because people want to have purpose people want to belong people want to have autonomy um so again that's an example of how that filters through and that people know they can say actually this is what it says on the school development plan and this aspect isn't representing that. So I don't think it's about sitting down and going through all the language and you mustn't use this because it's offensive. It's about making, we are open to change. We are open to listening. And this is what is important to us. And we recognize that these are the people we have in our community and they have a voice. Um, and I think that's it. It's devising a safe culture to challenge and be and listening and making change. So if I was to say to you, do microaggressions, are staff aware of them? I would put, I would say no, not not all of them. What I would say is that they are safe to hearing it, listening it, and understanding it's support and part of our agenda moving forward. Julie, <clears throat> thank you. Um, that's been a sensational part of the chat, if I'm honest with you. Um, and I think you exemplify what this book does really well. It's about educating each other about some things that may be uncomfortable to talk about, but unless we have those conversations, real change can't happen. Um, so I just want to say a massive thank you. And Hannah's just put in the chat, I don't know if you can see. Julie, you are fab, really enjoying the conversation. You are so open and honest and totally authentic. And Anne Louise. She's been my, my guru, isn't she, yeah. Hannah? Like many to <laughs> many, Hannah Wilson, Angela Brown as well. They're the, they're the, there's, there's many Benny, and of course Benny. That you, when you get into naming people, you miss people out. So I'm going to stop. But this is the book for Benny and um, Hannah. So they're amazing. So yeah, great. Um, I'm very grateful that your voice is part of it. So I think you're giving a lot of um, other people a voice as well. So oh, you've got me again. <laughs> um, Julie, thank you. You're more than welcome to stay on. Um, but I am going to ask Hannah. Hopefully she's ready. Oh, <laughs> I think Hannah's got. <laughs> Uh, we love you, Julie. Thank you so, so much. Right, I'm going to add Hannah. How are you? I am good. I wasn't crying. I actually had to take in my eye when you said <laughs> doing that. I'll probably be crying in about 10 minutes. But um, no, mean, mean that wholeheartedly, um, Julie. I caught a little bit of everyone's talks today. And, and I'm very proud of, to have everybody, not only in the Women-Led Network, the diverse Ed Network, in the book as well. But I do think Julie's narrative in particular does really really hit the heart mm, absolutely um yeah I've, i held back the tears with that one if i'm honest um right hannah wilson we know that i call hannah wonder woman wilson because you are incredible um so what an amazing chat there's so many authors i think that we could talk about but the ones for today were the women had contributors to this book um, and I think it just sort of exemplifies, again, this idea of intersectionality, that we've got people from lots of different um, grassroots movements coming together to create a really authentic story-based model that hopefully can real have real impact in the education system. So I'm going to ask you, firstly, um, to describe the story of the book from your perspective, and then I'll chip in with some questions, if that's okay, um, to end our amazing chat today. Sure. So I can't, I'm not sure whether Benny told you this part of the story not, or not, but um, August um, 2020, Benny and her then fiance, now wife, um, Emma, came down to see me because they'd left Oxford Trouble. We were no longer working together and we were sat in my garden having a gin and tonic in the sun. Um, I think Emma actually cut my lawn for me because she was so unimpressed at the length of my lawn. Um, and Benny and I just started talking about the fact that we really need to do a book because we have to keep reminding ourselves that only 10% of educators or 11% of educators are on Twitter. And we can feel like more people are aware than perhaps they are. 
Um, and Twitter can sometimes be quite divisive, but can also be quite soft, or you can find it hard to articulate yourself in full because, because of the bite-sizedness of it. So we had this idea of the book, and we sat there and sort of drafted what it might look like, how to really get that comprehensive arc across all of the protected characteristics. And think we were thinking really about the structure and how to get that balance. So that's where the kind of the book proposal idea came from. I had worked um, that year um, at the University of Buckingham running the PGCE, uh, and I'd been invited to go to a careers event for the English graduates to talk about my career as an English teacher. And I'd been sat next to Tom, the managing director of Our Now Book Publishers, who had come to talk about going into publishing. So you, you know I'm a connector, you know I'm a networker. We sat, we had a chat, we got on like a house on fire. He gave me his card, said, when you're ready to write a book, give me a shout, I want to publish it. So I literally rang up and said, we've got an idea for a book. Um, and we wanted to go with um, that publisher in particular because we wanted it to be published through an academic press. We, we were very, very committed to this being referenced work, academic work, that yes, there's narrative and yes, there's personal lived experience, but we need to move it into the conversations, the concrete conversations, and challenge the people who think that this is just storytelling and this is just people sharing sharing their personal narrative. And I heard you um, mentioning earlier on about sort of like the referencing side of it, the theory side of it is an academic book. We want it to be in PCEs, we want it to be on masters, we want it to be part of the MPQs. That's where we begin to really influence at scale. People thinking about DEI being that golden thread that goes through every aspect of school life. So it is really exciting to be getting emails from big institutions saying it's in the library, it's on the reading list, we've ordered a copy for everyone in our cohort. Um, so that's the kind of where the book came from. Then we had this crazy two years, really, um, of like herding cats, let's be honest about it, herding cats. Um, my environment was out of control. Um, because we had all the people who wanted to be in the book, all the people in the book, all the people who weren't in the book, and all the people who now knew about the book and wanted to be in the book. And it was like comms overload. And trying to manage that, because during, there, was, there was a lot of obviously like emotion of, around it. It, it. We are asking people to share quite personal stuff. So there was lots of um, recognition that we were managing people, but an emotional management of the journey and of the sharing. And also we had the cascade of the 10 chapter editors who were all doing this for free. And it takes time to, to manage a team of 10 people and to edit. And then all of the, the voices who are also doing this for free. So we, we, we constantly kind of jostled with the, we need that big redrafting, but it's not a good time of the year to be asking someone to be redrafting a piece. And let's not email them during the Easter holidays. We've got a deadline looming. So I think that being mindful of the human beings within the process was was a really important aspect so lots of deadlines were missed that was quite stressful at times when we we're being chased by the publishers but we got there and we were, and we were really proud to see it coming together because benny and i had supported half the book each so we had five teams five chapter editors and half half the card the writers each and then we began to read the other the other half of the book and you could begin to see the kind of the, the, the scope and the scale of the book. And, and that was when it was really exciting. And then there was this anticlimax, as you know, when the book was actually went to print because no one, no one saw it. I was out of the country. I don't think I saw the book for six weeks. It's like having a baby and not being able to meet your baby for six weeks. Um, everyone was tweeting about like, my book's not arrived, my book's not arrived. I think I had about 300 emails. How do my book's not arrived? I, like, I know, I haven't seen it yet either. So that was a little bit stressful that there was the anticipation about seeing the book and we had the book launch and most of us haven't actually seen it yet. <laughs> um, that's the kind of the, the very elongated and messy kind of narrative of the last two years. But we got there and it's in print and we now have a book. Absolutely. I, I, I think we said it right from the beginning. I think everyone who's involved in it is probably going to be one of the proudest things that you will be part of because it's, it's that ripple effect, isn't it? That it's in these organisations where hopefully we'll have the biggest impact. The one thing I do want to ask, though, how do we ensure? So it's great that they're on reading lists. It's great that they're on course lists and things like that. But we don't want it to be something that's tokenistic. And I think sometimes it can turn into that. So... You talk about the future, so what is on the horizon? So with the Diverse Ed blog, developing and diversifying the curriculum, which I think, again, is going to have real big impact. Expanding toolkits, face-to-face -face events, I think, definitely. Publishing the Diverse Ed book, the podcast, the book club, the Twitter chat, holding... So you've there's so many things, but how do we make sure on, on that ground level, grassroots, education, in the classroom, in the lecture theatres, how do we make sure that it doesn't become something tokenistic, that, yes, it's on your book list, but what are you doing with it? 
Yeah, see, see, I think being on the book list isn't tokenistic because if, I mean, we have had it on, like, for me, there hasn't been a lot of text that could have been on the book list. So I feel like the last two years, people have been dipping in and out. There has been a little bit of surface level commitment from some individuals and organisations. I think a lot of people thought this might pass or this might go away. But two years on, and when I say two years on, I mean from George Floyd's murder and the fallout of that and the kind of the, the knee-jerk reactivity from a lot of the school system to anti-racist work in particular, but then the spotlight being on the lack of DEI at, at large. I'm seeing a real shift or tipping point at the moment in my network that the early adopters, the pioneers, have been doing this work now for two to three years or, or longer, and we're now seeing the next trend show of people get on board. We've seen, we've seen heads and CEOs watching and waiting, and now they're leaning into the work, probably because they didn't have capacity before. We've had, we've had a, a really pressurised couple of years, and not every school was ready to do this work. So for me, we are, we are moving at scale now. It's really more embedded. There is more momentum. We've still got a long, long way to go and a lot of work to, to do. But I do feel like we're in a very different position now to when we actually did the proposal um, for the book. And I think the bit the bit to emphasise about the book is that it's a collective voice. If any of those 125 people had written their own book, it would have been quite a niche audience. But because their, their piece is situated contextually within a bigger narrative, not everyone's going to read the whole book, not everyone's going to read it in a linear way, but you can dip in and out of it. And I think for me, it's the exposure and the amplification that you're you're part of something bigger than just your own narrative. That that to me is what's really important. Fabulous, thank you, Hannah. Um, and it comes back to the idea of so that idea. So DIE work is very it's deep work. It is deep work because it's it's based it's, it's human, isn't it? Well, it's human, and so that work will be be done in schools hopefully. And I, like, I've had training with you with one of the schools that um, I've worked in. And it is, it's, it's getting people to understand, are you ready for this deep work? That if we're going to embed, implement it first, but embed it in a way that it's going to have real change, it is deep work. And with that does come a sense of responsibility as well. So what advice do you have to those that are willing to go on this journey with their staff or with their teams? Because it may uncover traumas it may uncover things that are uncomfortable it may uncover difficult conversations and I think that's it, it as, as it is an academic piece of work it's coming into a professional um place where actually it's going to get a bit messy because DEI work when you go deep will get messy so what's the advice and I know it's a big question no, no, um, it's a great question okay so there's a couple of things we talk about that you need to do the inner work before we can do the outer work. And, and, and as educators, we've got a bias to get busy and a bias to, to be active. You almost hold yourself back against that. But you can't be diverse the curriculum if you've not done the reflection of who you are and what your identity is and what your lens is and what your journey's been. That's part of that process. We can't divorce it. The doing and the being need, need to be bridged. And we really need to think about who's doing the doing, but what's the being, the behaviours that need to sit alongside that. So speaking to all the kind of the heads and the, and the SLTs listening, do mean don't ask anyone in your staff to share their story if you're not willing to share your own story? Because that's what's coming up quite a lot. Oh, we've got a, we've got a black middle leader. We've got a, a gay phase leader. We've got someone who's Muslim. Let's ask them to share their personal narrative and their lived experience. And they might be up for that. They might not. But if we're not prepared to share our own stories, like Julie's was modeled beautifully there, by her embracing her own lived experience, sharing her own vulnerability, her own authenticity, there's a power in that because that then creates the space and models the psychological safety and builds the trust for others to then do the same. And I saw this done really, really well um, recently. I was asked to go and do um, an inset day at a primary school in the, in the East Midlands. And I was just expected to have a quick introduction and then sort of like kick into facilitation mode. And the male primary head shared such a personal story about why this work was important to him, not only as a head teacher, but as a father. And there wasn't a dry eye in the room. And it, it actually, like, you know what I'm like, I do cry. I, I, I do wear my heart on my sleeve. I had to like turn around and, and like hold myself together because it was completely unexpected. And he came over and went, was that all right? So that was absolutely amazing. You have to set the tone for the whole day and shown why this work's important, but you've unlocked something in the staff. They've now seen you in a completely different way as a human, as both their head, but also as a father with children with needs, with a family with needs. That is so powerful. So I think that activation of our own personal narrative and sharing our own lived experience, and even if it is, hands up, I'm a straight white male Christian head teacher. 
if that is your identity, own it and, and leverage it and, and show your willingness and your vulnerability to actually learn and to listen and to perhaps step back from being at the top of the hierarchy to create space for others. But you are willing to, to kind of contribute as well. Oh, absolutely. And I think what you touched there is that idea, that lack of judgment, that if I'm open and willing to share, um, it's, it's that openness to that lack of judgment. This isn't about judging because it will be. And I remember um, head teacher where you did our training, he felt really uncomfortable being with that, the spectrum, the wheel that was shared. He's a white man. He's not, he isn't disabled. He's, he's, it, that made him feel uncomfortable. And I think that's important as well, that people own that, that it's okay to feel this way. Um, let's not nudge away from it, but let's own it and now we can move forward with it because that's going to galvanise that that change as well, that impact. Because if, like you say, if you're not self-aware, you can't be aware of what's around you as well. And that idea of the discomfort, like let's just be real for a second. We're asking people who don't feel uncomfortable very often to feel uncomfortable for a short amount of time as part of that learning journey. There are people in that room who are perpetually in a state of discomfort. And I, mean, I think so, so there needs to be a real recognition and awareness of that, that actually this is about us stepping into a space that is messy and is uncomfortable, but there's also a bit of a shake-up that needs to happen for us to perhaps appreciate and empathise what it is like to walk in other people's shoes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Hannah, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> right, I'm going to go to your some of your key questions now. Um, uh -huh. And this idea of how diverse is your network? And you um, you made me think a couple of weeks ago as well about just what I tweet out as well and how sometimes I can perpetuate this cycle that's already existing. Um, but how diverse is your network and how can you disrupt any group think tendencies? Because there is that idea that if you are surrounded by people with the same values and that it becomes an echo chamber, which can be enabling and empowering, but at the same time, it is still a group think tendency. So therefore you're not, reaching out to any other community so how would you go about doing that the first thing you need to do is a bit of a kind of a digital hygiene check health check where you actually go and have a look at like who am i connected with on linkedin who am i following on twitter who who have i amplified in the last 24 hours on any of the social media platforms i'm on and you might be quite shocked that you are following lots of people who look like you, think like you, and you are amplifying people with a shared identity. And I, I quite often go and look at the TES timeline or the Schools Week timeline. And I'm like, goodness gracious, are they aware that in the last 24 hours, they've only retweeted white male thought leaders in education? And every single headline or picture has got a straight white man on it. And like, I see that and it really, really winds me up, but, but we need more people to be able to see that and be able to disrupt that. And then you need to consciously curate not only who you're connected with and who you're listening to and learning from, but who you're also amplifying. And I, and I even check myself on this sometimes. So like in Pride Month, I've obviously amplified a lot of tweets around LGBTQ identities, but making sure that they're intersectional and they're people of faith or people of colour or people with disability. And it's not just the kind of the dominant LGBT group who I'm amplifying. Thinking about who you're not connected with and consciously going to find those people. So I, I heard you ask a few people earlier on, I think it was the question to Benny about like, what are your own gaps? So two of the gaps I've consciously been working on in the last few years, first years ahead, um, we had to do lots of work in our school around trans identities and non-binary identities. Um, and I consciously follow people who are, sh who are sharing, who are challenging, organisations who are supporting. So I've developed awareness in, in that identity group. And then one of the things we were challenged about in the book, and hands up, we made a mistake, we didn't make sure there was a GRT voice in the book. And I've consciously, begun to follow people like the Travellers Movement, charities, organisations and individuals who are sharing the Gypsy Women Traveller experience in education, but also in wider society, because that's the gap I'm, I'm currently consciously trying to trying to close. So it's that, when I get people to do that exercise from Benny's book about like, who are you? What have you experienced? What don't you know? What do you need to know? And how are you going to go and find out about it? That is how you begin to almost like think about who do I actually, how do I expand my network? How do I expand my thinking? And how do I consciously disrupt that group think um, situation? Okay, thank you, Hannah. Right, last one, it's a big question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. What would an equitable policy look like to you? So CEO of the trust, what would that policy look like to enable equity across your trust? So it depends what the policy is on, doesn't it? So I think we have to look um, at all policies about diversity, equity and inclusion. 
because it's interesting a lot of schools and trusts come to do this work and they want to do this work in the child facing work and and i say to them and my colleagues who also do this work say to them we well, can't just pick one stakeholder group you can't just pick one characteristic if you're going to do this work and do this work truly deeply authentically then you need to look at all stakeholder groups and all identities so that's the, almost like the first challenge DEI is about everybody and every aspect of school life. Then, I mean, the challenge quite often is equity is working quite well for the children and they haven't considered equity for the staff. So thinking about equitable policies for the staff might start with salaries, for example. Have you got a male and a female at the same grade in, in your school doing the same role who, who are being paid inequitably? So there's no point saying that we are a school doing DEI work if you're going to be perpetuating the gender pay gap or the BME pay gap. And there was a really interesting um, bot on International Women's Day that every time a school or a trust tweeted out, look at us, we're celebrating International Women's Day, got called out for their gender pay gap in their organisation. And I think that's where the disconnect or the dissonance kind of kicks in. So going back to this idea of a policy, I think it's twofold, isn't it, or threefold. It's the what's in the policy, who has written and ratified the policy, and who is that policy actually serving? and thinking about how you triangulate that. And the example I give in my training sessions around where policies go wrong is that if you've got an all white SLT writing an anti-racist policy, who have you consulted? And does that policy um, further marginalise or empower the people it's intended to serve? Similarly, a lot of schools are doing gender neutral uniform policies. Have you consulted anybody who's non-binary or trans to make sure that policy meets their needs as the learner or the parent and carer's needs? So for me, it's that, like it's the, it's doing the sense checking around it. It's not, it, I think the tokenistic bit is we write the policy. Here's our gender neutral uniform policy. Here's our anti-racist policy. The equity bit is really interrogating it and scrutinizing it and getting the feedback make sure that when it's ratified, it's had all of those different touch points. Because I think a lot of the time you've got very well-intended governors, a very well-intended SLT, who are doing the policies they know we need, but, uh, but it's been rushed through because we're all so busy and under so much pressure. Slow it down and make sure that that feedback loop is built into it. It's that deep work, isn't it? To enable that deep work, you need to do the deep work beforehand. So, yeah. Hannah, I'm going to leave it there. This was an incredible book chat um, and thank you so much for your time as well. But this is, I can't I can't say enough really that it should really be in every school, but not just sitting on a bookcase. And you mean as I, as you're about having that book club and then inviting people into it or sharing ideas and briefings and things like that. Um, it's, yeah, it's going to make the world a little more beautiful, I think. <laughs> And two things. Firstly, thank you from Benny and I to everybody who's in the book, um, chapter editors and contributors. Um, and I know Jill's here tweeting away. Massive thank you to Jill, who's been our, big, our biggest cheerleader um, for the book and for everybody who's in the book as well. But I think another thank you for everyone who's shared their narrative today. And a big thank you to you, Kieran. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think people appreciate how much time and energy it takes to actually organise the Women's Book Club. And you do a brilliant job amplifying diverse voices. So thank you for organising us all today and hurting us because we have all been cats <laughs> the last few weeks. And we appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate all of you for the time and the energy as well. So I think, um, yeah, it's exciting times. And I think it's the right time with what you've said. I think this is the right time. And I don't know about you, but going into museums and galleries and things like that, I have seen a massive shift in what they're promoting as art and inclusivity as well. So um yeah and and also hannah is up for an award so <laughs> tweet that out as well. <laughs> happy sunday everyone look after yourselves and have a really good week back at school bye everyone thank you again everyone